<laughs> that was all for my benefit, everybody, because you know what happens tonight. The Packers are going to beat up on the Bears, and and everybody's just all the Bear fans are happy this morning, but you're gonna you're not going to be tonight. That's all I got to say. And uh, want to welcome you guys. I, uh, the big uh, question I'm getting all morning: Hey, did you get a bear last week? The answer is is no. Didn't even see one. Uh, but had an absolute riot just hiking the uh, the mountains of Pennsylvania uh, for for four days straight. We we literally sun up to sundown. We would just uh, hike the mountains of Pennsylvania looking for bear. But we found out that only two percent of bear hunters actually take a bear in Pennsylvania. Two percent, isn't that something? So it's a very low population of bear, lots of ground to cover, and had an absolute riot. Just had a, tons and tons of fun. Can't wait to go back. Again, today I'm going to talk about, uh, kind of finish up the series of gratitude that, that this is something I'm very, very passionate about. And I'll tell you something about me that a lot of you may not know, some of you, you might, but uh, I went to a, a private Christian college and actually I was a music major and a Bible minor and um, that was for my undergrad. And then uh, after that, I got hired, after college, I got hired as a music minister at a, uh, at a little town in DeMott, Indiana, three 3,000 people live there. It's about an hour and 10 minutes straight west of here on, on Highway 10. And uh, was actually the, the youth pastor resigned right before I went there. So they, they, they asked me to take over the youth ministry for about six months, and that turned into five years of, of youth ministry and music ministry. And then my wife and I moved to uh, Milwaukee at a much larger church that did music, strictly music ministry there. And, um, of course, came here 16 years ago and, and, and planted new songs. So... Uh, I, I know I know something about music. I know something about worship. It's something that I am very very passionate about. I have I have literally led thousands of of uh, worship sets. You know, times of worship. Um, it's just something. There's a part of me that that you guys have never seen, or, or not very many have seen. And um, and I I would much rather be doing this. I know I'm in God's perfect calling to doing this, but sometimes I I do miss leading in worship. I do miss. Uh, music ministry, and he used to travel a lot and speak at conferences and seminars and, and teach about the subject. So something I'm well-versed in, it comes very naturally for me to teach. It's easy for me to teach. And I want you to listen up because um, there's some things in this message today that's going to change your life if you allow it to. The Bible says that, that uh, when people come into a setting like this and they hear the word of the Lord, that, uh, that a lot of times that word is choked out, it's dried up, it's stolen. But, but we're not that type of people here at New Song. The Bible says also in that, same, in that same verse of Scripture that there are those of us who allow the Word of God to penetrate our heart, to grow inside of us. And the Bible says it produces a harvest 30, 60, or 100-fold. I don't know about you, but I want the Word of God to change my life, not just, not just change my moment. I, I want the Word of God to change my life. I don't want it to get stolen from me. I don't want it to get dried out. I want it to produce a harvest. And today, if you listen, this is life-changing stuff. And I want to set the stage um, uh, for this right off the bat. Uh, letter A, take this, write this down, because this is the basis of what we're talking about today, that sin qualifies us for mercy. Write that down. Sin qualifies us for mercy. I am extremely qualified for mercy, everybody, because I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In fact, it's something that we love to say here that new song, if, you're, if people come in and they say, you know what, I've just done too much, I've, I've sinned far too much, I've rebelled against God far too much or for far too long, uh, that, that God isn't going to accept me, he's not going to show me grace, he's not going to show me mercy because I, I just don't deserve it, I'm just too far gone. And, and actually the very nature of mercy and grace is that it's undeserved. It's the, in fact, we say it this way, that, that the more you have sinned, the more qualified you are for mercy. Like the, 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 if you consider yourself just a, a huge sin or just somebody's rebelled against God and like, boy, I, hey, listen, we actually see it this way, that you're actually far, far more qualified for mercy than you realize. Like, hello, it, that's what it's meant for. It's meant for you. Grace is meant for you. And certainly it's undeserved. So sin qualifies us for mercy. And mercy qualifies us for worship. That when we receive the mercy and the grace of God and we are changed by the Spirit of God, we've been washed clean, we've been forgiven, we've called upon the name of the Lord and He forgave us our sins, that that mercy that we've received from God actually qualifies us 
for worship. So by a show of hands, 100% participation, how many here have qualified for mercy? Okay, and then how many here as believers, you qualify for worship because you've received mercy? See, we're all worshipers. We should all be worshipers. And, 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 and I say it this way, a lot of people then come into a moment like this, a place like this, and because they don't feel qualified for grace, they don't feel qualified for mercy, they certainly don't feel qualified to worship. Or, or, or they, they just say, you know, there's just a lot of stuff wrong with me, and boy, if I lift my hands, if I praise, if I, if I shout, if I, if I sing, if I clap, if I, if I really worship the Lord, I'm, I'm, just, a, I'm just a hypocrite, you know, because can I tell you something about that? Let me just break that myth. Because it, it's a myth. In fact, let me go deeper. That is a lie from the enemy. It's an absolute lie from the enemy. And here, here's how I want to say it. Don't let what's wrong with you keep you from worshiping what's right with God. Don't let what's wrong with you keep you from worshiping what's right with God. Because whether you're a sinner or not, and we all are, God is worthy of our worship. He's done everything right. He's done everything perfectly because he is a perfect father to us. And don't let what's wrong with you keep you from worshiping what's right with God. There have been a lot of times that I've been in this moment, I've been in this place, I've been in worship services, and, and I didn't feel like I, I could worship. I didn't feel like, uh, like I'd even deserve to worship God. And I have to remind myself, no, if I don't worship him, the Bible says, if we don't worship him, the rocks cry out, like, Everybody, God is worthy of worship. Whether you feel like it or not, he's worthy of worship. Can I say this too? Worship actually doesn't benefit God. Well, why do we do it then? Well, great question. I'm glad you asked. Because here, here's the truth of the matter. If you say, if, if worship doesn't benefit God, then why do we worship? Let, let me say it this way. God, God is God whether you worship him or not. And he is not weakened when people don't worship him. He's just as strong as he's always been if you don't worship him. Worship does not benefit God. He's God regardless of whether you worship him or not. So if the beneficiary must, if the beneficiary isn't God, the beneficiary must be you. Like God wants you to worship. God wants you to praise. And in doing so, what's happening is you're actually, you're actually it's, a, it's a symbolic of relinquishing control and saying, God, you're greater than I. You're, you're better than I. You're bigger than I. You're more powerful than I. And you're actually, it's an act of surrender. It's an actually, a, it, it's, an, it's, a, um, it, it's an admission of your weaknesses and his strength, that he's greater than you are, that he can heal when you can't. He can deliver when you can't. He can save when you can't. And so if you're in this place and, and you don't feel like worshiping God, that's when you worship him all the more. And I cannot wait to teach this to you, everybody. Can you tell I love to teach about worship? Because it's so fun. The greatest moments of my life, many, many of the greatest moments of my life have happened when I was worshiping my heavenly father and his son, Jesus Christ. And if you're not worshiping, you're missing out. Let's look at the book of Luke, chapter 17, verse 11. And, and this, is, this is something powerful, and I want you to catch this. Maybe you've read through this before, but I want you to see what's really happening. I'm going to point out some things that maybe you've never noticed before. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And he was going, as he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him, and they stood at a distance like they were supposed to do at that time and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And when he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Let's stop right there. As they went, they were cleansed. When he said, go show yourselves to the priests, he, what he was saying was, he was saying, hey, listen, there's a healing that's coming your way. And if you were a leper and all of a sudden your leprosy went away, one of the obligations that you had to fulfill under the law was to present yourself to a priest 
and a priest would actually declare you as being clean, as being healed. Like, okay, this guy used to have leprosy, but now he doesn't. He's clean. And, and he, it, it would almost be like the doctor signing off on it that, okay, you're free and clear. You can go back to work. That's what this was, except the priest did that. So Jesus told these lepers, hey, go show yourselves to the priest. But he didn't heal them automatically. The, the Bible says that as they went to the priest, as they started walking, that's when they were healed. Can, can I tell you something, everybody? That, that a lot of times... When, when, we're before, when we're asking God for the miraculous, God is very willing to do that, but he also wants you to act in faith. And because these men acted in faith, now let me say this. It, had they looked at Jesus and said, well, if you're not going to heal me now, no thanks, I'll, I'll just go the other direction, do you think they would have received a healing? I don't think so. Jesus was saying, hey, listen, once you apply your faith, you're going to see the miraculous. How many know we live by faith, we walk by faith, we see the blessings of our God upon our lives by faith. What we see in our lives, the goodness of God, we see by faith. We receive by faith. That's why the Bible says that this is multiple times, hey, when you believe or when you ask for something, believe and do not doubt. Don't doubt. Like the Bible never tells you to doubt, always says, Believe always says you to uh, always says to live a life of faith, and they received their healing because they lived and they walked, and they made the choice in the moment to do it by faith. Go show yourselves to the priest, and as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw he was healed, he came back praising God in a loud voice, not a soft voice. It was a loud voice. It was an outward expression of praise to Jesus, and he threw himself at Jesus' feet, and he thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. He wasn't a Jew. He was somebody that was very much looked down upon in society, and he's the one that came back and thanked Jesus by throwing himself at Jesus' feet. And Jesus asked, we're not all 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? And then he said to him, rise and go, your faith, your faith has made you well. So let, let me break something down for you very quickly. First of all, if, if and I, I really believe, I don't believe there's a, a happening in the Bible that's there by coincidence or chance. I think everything is there for a reason, that it is Holy Spirit inspired. Every story is placed there because God wanted you to read it, and it's significant. It's important. I don't think it's a coincidence that only one person out of the 10 came back to worship Jesus. In fact, let me explain something to you. Uh, during all of my college years, for instance, we did, we did a, a Christian concert. I was in a band that traveled all summer long. We did a Christian concert every single night, and a lot of that was just a, a worship service that we would lead in. And I have, I have played in front of crowds of, of, of 10,000 people. I mean, I've I've just seen, I've just been around worship for a long, long time, not only leading in worship services as a worship pastor, but even prior to that. And I have been in hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of churches across this nation. And it seems to me, and it always has seemed to me, that about 10% of people that are in churches supposedly worship God actually worship God in spirit and in truth. Like there's only about 10% engagement. Now, that doesn't necessarily happen at New Song. I think we have freedom here. And even this morning, but you know full well that there was far more than 10% worshiping Jesus, to which I am extremely grateful for that. I, I applaud you for that. But if you were to travel this nation and just go from church to church to church to church to church, you would not see very many people truly engaged in worship. And a lot of them might say some things to you as to excuses, which we'll get to in a second, but there's not a lot of people truly engaging in worship around this nation. And yet you travel the world, especially third world countries, and it, it's the exact opposite. It's 90% participation. I mean, it's unreal. And I think part of that is because that here in America, everybody is so independent. They're so, uh, uh, how, how do I say this? 
that they really feel that everything that they have comes from themselves, like they worked hard for it, and they, they got it themselves, and God didn't have very much to do with it, and they're, they're, they're so self-absorbed, they're, they're so like self-reliant that they're not relying upon the God that they should be relying upon. And actually the Bible talks about that, that that's not the way to live life, that every good thing comes down from the Father of lights. The Bible says every good and perfect thing comes down from our, our Heavenly Father. And we've got to realize that. We, we just got to realize that. So these out of these 10 that were healed, only one came back and worshiped the Lord. Let, let, let her be, write this down. That all of them prayed but not all of them praised. And we see that too, in, especially in America, that a lot of people come and they pray, but not a lot of people praise. They ask God for things. They want things from God. They want the blessings of God, or they want God to bail them out, but they don't often turn that prayer into a praise or follow that prayer by a praise. So, so here we had nine out of 10 that prayed, but they didn't praise. And Jesus is actually looking at the, the one saying, where are the other nine? Because didn't I answer all of your prayers? And what he's saying is, aren't I worthy to be praised by all 10 of you? But only one came back. And he's pointing out the fact that there are a lot of people that pray, but there's, a not, there's not a lot of people that praise. And Jesus says, that should not be the case. Sure, pray. Present your request to God. The Bible says to do that, but follow that with praise. In fact, isn't that the way Jesus told the disciples to pray? In fact, if, if you go to the Lord's Prayer, doesn't he start it saying, hey, if you're going to pray, pray this way, our Heavenly Father, hallowed be your name. Like to actually not just start with prayer, but actually start with praise. That's how important it is. When Jesus was teaching his disciples to pray, oh, don't start with prayer, start with praise. Start with honor. Start with, start with being in awe of who God is. That's how you start. So all prayed, but not all praised. Let her see, write this down. They focused on the blessing, but they didn't focus on the one who blesses. They focused on the blessing. They focused on the benefit, the reward of their prayer, the miraculous, the blessing, but they, they didn't focus on the one who blesses. And yet, if I were to ask you how many of you have, you just know that God has answered your prayers, but I'll say, yeah, I, I've had lots of prayers answered. And so many times people receive from God, but they don't give back to God in praise worship. In fact, how many times have your children begged for something? Your grandchildren begged for something and you gave it to them because you love them. And what did they do? They just took off. <laughs> no thanks. No, no, no. Hey, dad, that was really generous. Hey, mom, thank you for that. That really means the world to me. It's just they take it and they go. How many times do we do that as Christians? We take the blessings of God and then we go. How many times do we actually not even realize the blessings of God when he gives us things, when he blesses us with things? Because how many good things there are in your life? The Bible says that every good and perfect thing comes down from the Father. How, how many good things are in your life? If you say there's a lot, then you've been blessed a lot. You have reason to praise. I promise you that. And so we worship Jesus. We're called to worship Jesus. We're called to worship our Heavenly Father. And I, I'm going to teach this to you, that we worship, first of all, first and foremost, number one, write it down, because Jesus is worthy. Because Jesus is worthy. Worship, worship is not based on your feelings. Worship is based on God's worth. Worship is not based upon your feelings. Worship is based on God's worth. In fact, the, the core word for worship is actually worth-ship. We, we give it to him because it's due him. He's worthy of it. It is worth-ship. Many times I've been in this room, and no doubt you have too, and maybe some of you have been even this very day, and worship is happening, and we're encouraging to, to bless the Lord, and 
exalt the Lord and and maybe somehow in some different way, you're just like, ah, today I'm just not, I'm just not feeling it. Today, I just got other things on my mind. Today, I'm just, oh, I'm just so tired. Justin, if you know, if you knew what I've been through, if you knew what kind of weekend this was, if you knew how long it was, I'm just exhausted. I just got other things on my mind. I just, can I tell you something? That worship is never based upon your feelings. It's always based upon His Word. And I learned a long time ago that on those days that the devil would try to distract me from worship are the days that I need to worship him all the more. When I don't feel like worshiping him, that's the day I need to worship him all the more because something isn't right in me. If I'm not focusing on the goodness and the grace of our God, our Heavenly Father, then something needs to be checked inside of me. Something needs to be corrected. So when I'm not feeling it, I go to God and say, God, I don't know why I'm not feeling it today, but I bless you anyway. I worship you anyway. I praise you anyway. You're good. My feelings have nothing to do with your goodness, Lord. You're good all the time, and I'm going to bless you because of it. I'm going to worship you. And Lord, fix whatever is wrong in me that doesn't feel like worshiping today. Just fix that. And I just worship anyway. Sometimes I'm so distracted by what's happening that, that I'm looking around. I'm, 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 I'm watching out for people. In fact, it happened this morning. Um, uh, uh, we had uh, some some distractions this morning at at first service, and and I was taking care of some things. And in the middle of that, I made sure that as I was taking care of some things, some a few surprises, that I was worshiping Jesus anyway because He's worthy of it. I, I don't want to be distracted. I don't want to be. I, I don't want to uh, 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 be 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 caught looking at others or looking at other circumstances or or feeling what I feel when when I'm in the moment to bless God especially with other believers. Can, can you believe we live in a nation that allows us to gather into one room and lift high the name of Jesus Christ together corporately? Isn't that amazing? I mean, that's amazing. There's some countries that you can't do that in. We have some friends that, 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 that are missionaries that are, that are in countries where if they find out that they're leading people in worship, they're going straight to jail. And many of them are being flogged and tortured if they're caught. Many of them are being sent back to the States and saying, hey, you can never enter into this country again, all because they're just trying to lead some people and worship. Can I tell you that, that there's a reason for that? It's because the devil is threatened by our worship. He is bothered by our worship, and he is trying to stop it worldwide. He doesn't want pre- people worshiping Jesus. You know why? Because when you're in a moment like this and you're worshiping Jesus and we're praising God, the Bible says when we worship him, he shows up. When we worship him, he's there. And when he shows up, healing comes, deliverance comes, salvation comes. The devil doesn't want us worshiping God because when we worship him together, things change for our good. Things are changed for all of eternity when we worship the Lord Jesus Christ. So we worship because Jesus is worthy. Revelation chapter 5 says this, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands and one thousands and 10,000 times 10,000, and they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And in a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Why are those words being spoken and being sang? Because Jesus is worthy. He's worthy to be praised. They say it this way, worthy is the lamb. Can I show you something else that is so cool in this? That is, that is John the Revelator is writing down and he's hearing these things from heaven. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive, watch this, power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. It's almost as if, man, we can't think of enough words to describe our heavenly father, to describe Jesus Christ, our savior. We can't think of enough words. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Do you worship the Lord using the same words all the time? Can I challenge you in that? That there are so many ways, so many words to use to worship God. 
If you're like, well, I don't, I just kind of use the same words. Like, oh, I, I worship you or I, I praise you. There's nothing wrong with that. But I would challenge you, go to the book of Psalms. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, you, you'll find hundreds of ways to worship Jesus. You'll find hundreds of ways and, and, and different words to praise him. To, to all of a sudden, you'll, you'll, you'll just start discovering new ways, new proclamations, new declarations. And I don't know about you, but I want my worship to be fresh. Like, I want it to be alive. I, I don't want it to be repetitive. I, I don't want to do something just out of habit. Let me say it that way. I want to do it because it's in my heart to do it. And then I, I just look for different ways to, to, talk to, to talk to my father, to talk to Jesus. I remember the first time I, I was just thinking about different ways to worship Jesus. And I was thinking about all the terms that maybe people use around here or use in society, maybe old-fashioned ways. And I, I remember... I remember in just worshiping Jesus, I said, Jesus, you're the apple of my eye. Now, I've never told anybody that before, not even my wife. But it just came to me, like, Jesus, you, you are everything to me. You're, you're, you're so wonderful. You're so gracious. You're so kind. What about the names of Jesus? You could just proclaim the names of Jesus all day long. My, my mom, if you go to my mom's house, she has this 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 uh, this art, this wall art, this plaque. It's not really a plaque; it's a, it's a piece of art in her house, and it's just nothing but the names of Jesus, just over and over and over again, the names of Jesus. And there are lots of names of Jesus, and you can worship Him with each one. It's, Jesus, I bless you. You're the Prince of Peace. You're the Mighty God. You're the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the rose of Sharon, the, the lily of the valley. You are the bright and morning star. See, I could go on and on and on just with ways to worship Jesus. Why? Because he is worthy of it. He's worthy of it. Second thing, we worship because Jesus is the object of our affection. He is the apple of our eye, and he deserves promotion. He deserves promotion. Now, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to say it like this, maybe a great illustration is if, if there's a company out there that's about to go bankrupt and, and their last attempt is to hire this new marketing executive. So they're about to go under, but they, they hire this new marketing executive and he puts together this absolutely amazing ad campaign and literally turns that company around. He deserves, how many know he deserves a promotion? Like, like, he obviously deserves a pay raise. He deserves, um, you know, head of the marketing department. He might deserve a corner office. He just deserves promotion, right? But here we are in our sin, and, and in fact, God puts together the perfect campaign because our spiritual lives were bankrupt, and we were actually losing the battle. Instead of losing our jobs, we were actually just losing at life. And God puts this incredible campaign together and he actually sends his son to do something that we couldn't do. He purchased our salvation. He bore our sins on the cross. He was crucified and he died, but then he was raised to life three days later and he ascended to the right hand of the father and he's making intercession. I'm telling you everybody, it was the perfect campaign. How many know that Jesus deserves some promotion? He deserves a promotion. He deserves to be lifted high. He deserves to be exalted. He deserves our thanks. He deserves our gratitude. He deserves our praise. That's why the Bible says in Psalm 107 verse 2, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Like it should be coming out of your mouth. The Bible says that faith, uh, Paul writes to the Corinthians, faith is a matter of believing and speaking, believing and speaking. That's why the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If we've been saved by grace through faith, then it should, it should just be able, it should come out of our mouth. It should be something that we easily talk about all the time because Jesus deserves promotion and God wants us to promote his son. He wants us to promote his son. In fact, Psalm 145 verse one says, I lift you high in praise, my God, Oh, my king, I lift you high in praise. 
because you deserve promotion. That's why the Bible uses words like, I magnify God, I exalt God, I lift high the name of Jesus. He deserves promotion. He deserves promotion. The last thing, and this is something that really a lot of people struggle with, and we're going to deal with it today. We worship with outward expressions of inward love. With outward expressions of inward love. Let me say it this way. I have, I have spoken to so many people who say, you know what, I really love Jesus. I'm just not very expressionate. Like, I, yeah, I love Jesus, but I'm, I'm a little bit shy. I love Jesus, but I don't like to sing. I don't really, you know, I don't, I'm just not a person that really shows emotions. I, I, I love Jesus, but I, I just want to sit at the, at the back and not have anybody look, look at me. I, I don't want to be the center of attention. I, I love Jesus, but I just can't do what everybody else does. Can I tell you something? Hey, that you are missing out on one of the greatest things that you could give to God, which is your everything, that, that you would not be ashamed of him. In, in fact, everybody, I, I would say to you, if you, love, if you love God, but you say, well, I can love God, but I'm just not going to tell anybody. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to express it. I'm not going to show it. Think about this. If I did that to my wife, I, I, well, I, I love my life. I just don't show it. I don't ever express it. I don't ever, I, I don't ever give her words of encouragement. I don't ever write her cards. I don't ever give her hugs. I don't ever buy her presents. Oh, well, sure, I love her. I just don't show it. You would look at me and my wife and say, something's wrong with that. How come we can say that about husbands and wives, but we don't say that about our relationship with our heavenly father? Because if you have this true inward love for Jesus, it's going to come out. It, like, okay, so I was gone for, for, you know, this bear hunt for multiple days. And when I came back, like, the first thing I did was I bypassed my kids and I went straight to my wife and I gave her a hug. And, and, and I told her, I said, I missed my best friend. And we hugged and we hugged and we hugged some more. And then every day after that, I just kept hugging her. Like yesterday, I must have hugged my wife eight times. I probably told her I loved her 10 times. Why? Because if I have this inward love for my spouse, I'm not going to be able to keep that in. I'm going to have to show that to her. I'm going to have to speak that out. And, and I would challenge you, if that's you, like, well, I'm just a shy person. Can I challenge you just to break out of that mindset? Because you are missing out on something that's a benefit to you. In fact, let me challenge you even more. Well, I just, I just worship God quietly. I just, I, just, I just really don't say anything because that's just kind of who I am. I, I love him, but I don't really worship him outwardly at all. Can I tell you something? That is nowhere in the Bible. Did you know that? Like that mindset? Why well, I, I can just, I'll just worship Jesus, but I'm not, I'm not really going to do anything, though. I'm not going to sing. I'm not going to clap. I'm not going to shout. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do anything except just stand here. Can I tell you something? That is not in the Bible. It's not. In fact, it's quite opposite in the Bible. And you can read it through the Old Testament and through the New Testament. Verses like this, Luke 6, 45 says, For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Like if you love Jesus, it's going to come out of your mouth. If Jesus is the object of your affection, he, he, he is going, it's going to come out of your mouth. Praise to Jesus is going to come out of your mouth because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I say it this way, that the easiest words to say are the ones you cannot contain. I'm going to say it again. The easiest words for you to say are the ones that you cannot contain. It's the ones that just, they just come out and they just, like, like when, when, when the Bears get beat by the Packers tonight, a lot of you, these words can't contain, oh, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're not going to be able to contain your disappointment when it happens tonight. And my, my joy will, you'll hear it. I'm going to raise it from the rooftops, everybody. I'm, see, the words, that, the words that come the easiest are the words that you cannot contain. 
And if you really love Jesus, you can't contain those words. Let, let me say, let, let me give you another one. Ephesians 5 says that we sing and make music from our hearts to the Lord. Again, it's something in our heart that, that we sing and we make music. It's one of the reasons that we name this church New Song. For God put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to my God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. You know what he was singing about? He was singing about the fact that people were going to come to Jesus and put their trust in Jesus. That was his new song. Like people are going to come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we named this church New Song. So that people would come to, to faith and they would sing new songs that they've never sung before. It's the song of the redeemed, everybody. Good stuff. Well, what about this one? Psalm 47. Come. He says, come everyone. Come everyone. Clap your hands. Shout to God with joyful praise. Come everyone. Oh, but that's just not who I am. It's who you should be. It's who, you're, it's who you, you should be maturing into. To say, I am not ashamed of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. And I will not, I cannot contain these words and these expressions because I have this inward love that's just going to naturally flow out of me. It's just going to be a natural flow in my life. Just like the way that I've been hugging my wife over this past, in fact, for years, years, ever since we've been married, I have this inner love for my wife and I cannot contain it. So I embrace her, I hug her, we snuggle together, we, we encourage each other, we, we spend quality time together because she's the love of my life. How, how, I can't contain what I feel inside. It's the same way with Christ. Do you love Jesus today? Well, don't try to keep it in. In fact, everybody, let's let it out, but let's do it in order. Let's not get weird, it's not so you can get attention. It's not so people can stare at you. It's because you have these words that you want to express that you can no longer contain. They just got to come out. They just got to, because you love Jesus. You got to clap because, well, if I don't do something, I'm going to go nuts if I don't praise Jesus right now. And so you clap and you shout and you sing and you kneel before him. You, you just worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, how he longs to be worshiped, not for his benefit. He's still God. It's for your benefit. It's so that he can continue to do the miraculous in you. It's because when we gather together in his name, he's here. And when we worship him, he's here. And when he shows up, it's powerful, everybody. It's powerful. Come on, everybody. Let's stand up and worship the Lord. Just for a moment. Let's just end like this. Let's, in fact, the Bible says that we lift up holy hands and we bless the Lord. Another verse says that we lift up our hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Can we do that first and foremost? You say, I don't raise my hands in church. Well, get over that. You should. Come on, let's just bless the Lord. Father, we bless you. We worship you. We praise you for who you are. You are merciful. You are good. You're gracious. You're kind. Father, you've been generous to us. You are life-giving. You are deliverer. You are restorer. You're the one who reconciles us to yourself through Jesus Christ. Father, we worship you and we bless you for being so good. Everything that is good and perfect comes down from you. So we bless you for your goodness. We bless you for your perfection. We bless you for your justice we bless you for the fact that you see us and you know us and you love us and you sent your son to die on the cross that while we were still sinners christ died for us lord you are worthy to be praised you alone are the object of our affection we honor you we magnify you we exalt you we lift you up we glorify you in all things at all times because you are worthy of it. You alone are worthy of all the praise. There is nothing that you can't do. There's nothing that you cannot do, Father. Nothing is impossible with you because you are so powerful. You're so majestic. You're so magnificent. You're so wonderful in all of your ways. And we love you, and we worship you, and we exalt you. Come on, let, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. Let's just bless him. Let's just bless him. Father, we bless you. We worship you. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Come on, let's.
Let's sing, everybody.